This is a video on function trains. Trains are fairly new to APL. They appeared with Dialog APL version 14 in 2014. They are pretty useful, but they're not new. They've been in use in the J language for years. Basically, trains are a series of functions in isolated form. Isolated here is the keyword. This is a train. It is isolated from data. There is no data next to it. A train of three functions is called a fork. This is a fork. It is made of the functions f, g, and h. This is a train. It is isolated from its arguments with parentheses. The way it works is like this. The function h will receive the left argument and the right argument. The function f will receive the left argument and the right argument and both results will be given to the function in the middle, g here. Let's see an example. We have function f, g, and h that are defined. We have the left argument and the right argument defined. If we put the three functions in isolated form using parens, we can give it left and right arguments, just like this. This becomes this which becomes this, which becomes this, which becomes this, and we get the final answer. If we give it a name, we can give it the same arguments and get the same result. This one is the average. It is a fork. It is the sum divided by the number of elements, the shape. So operators take precedence over trains so that plus slash a sum is bound before the train. Since 2014, tally, this function here, is preferred to shape because of its nature. Tally returns the number of elements on the leading dimension, so this is also a definition of the average. If we give it a name, we can apply it to a list of numbers just like this. The left hand can be an array. For example, this forks compute 1 plus the inverse of its argument. In this case here, it's going to be 1 plus the inverse of 4, which is 0.25, result 1.25. A train can also come into a two-function form called an ATOP. The rule is the arguments are given to the right-hand function and its result is given to the left-hand function. So in this case, 2 and the 3 are given to the h function, and its result is given to the left function. Here is another example, the floor of the division. We can use it to find the integer part of a floating point number. So for example here, 10 divided by 4 is 2.5, and the integer part is 2. Since a train is itself a function, we can have an unlimited number of functions to form a train. This is another train. We can see that it has six elements. It is an ATOP, as we shall see. The function on the right is a fork, and that fork contains itself a fork as a function on the right. Here are a few examples of trains. We want to add 15% to the Ravel of the argument. It is simply 1.15 times the Ravel. We Ravel the matrix, multiply by 1.15, and here is the result. Here's another one. Here we compute the sine and square it. Note that we use swap to raise to the power 2. We can't put the 2 on the right, it has to go on the left, so we just swap the arguments to power. Here is another version. This time it's an ATOP. Again, we use swap, but this time, monadically, the result of the sign will be passed on to multiply, and swap will just multiply by itself, effectively squaring the number. Here we compute the geometric average. This is a five-time train. We have a fork within a fork. This is the same thing, except that this time, the right-hand function is a composed function. We want the sum of the product of two sets. It's the sum 
of the product. It's an eight up. Here we want the difference between the maximum and the minimum. We take the largest number and we subtract the smallest number. It's a fork with two derived functions. Here we want to compute Fahrenheit from Celsius. Here we want to sort any array. Note that the left line is a composed function. We want to sum all the elements of an array. This is an eight up, the sum of the rival. Here we want to know if an array is empty. We simply ask if a zero is a member of the shape. We want to know the position of an element or zero if it's not there. So we check if it's a member and we multiply by its position. So here we check what is the position of 8 and 9 in the set 1, 2, 4, 8 and 16. 8 is in the fourth position and 9 is not there so we return 0. Here we want to know the numbers making up a fraction. In this case the left line of this fork is itself a fork. Because it has to be treated as a fork we have to isolate it the number 0 0.25 is effectively the number 1 divided by 4. Here we want to surround a string with brackets. So the right hand function is a composed function that catenates the right bracket to the right and then we catenate simply the result of this with a left bracket. Here we want to cut a string on a specific character. So we check if where the character is equal and we use it to cut the left argument. Note that this is the way the cut function works and it starts cutting at the first character that it encounters. So ASD here is not part of the result. Here we want to cut a string on a group of character. We simply change the equal function by the membership function. So now we can cut on both comma and period. Now we want to remove the leading character, so we keep building this function here. So we have the member, we have the same function we had before on the right, and this time we drop one character in each one of the strings that have been cut, effectively removing the delimiter. This time we add the delimiter at the beginning of the string. If you look at the third function from the right, it is itself a fork. We catenate one to the Boolean vector resulting from comparing the string with the delimiter, the right argument. That is used to cut on the string given by catenating together the right argument to the left argument. Once this is done, we remove one character from each one of the strings that have resulted. Now, in this one, this is the same function as before, except that at the end, we remove the empty string. In this next example, we want to split a string at the first occurrence of a character. So on the right hand side we find where the character is and we use that to drop from the string. And The left function is the same thing except that we take from the string and the function in the middle simply glues the two together. Note that the one in the middle is a defen. You can have any type of function you want for any of the tines of a train including traditional functions. So here we split St. John from Paul. Here are some examples taken from another video. We drop a number after padding a zero to the right, effectively shifting everything to the left, one number. So here's the function. We could have written it also this way. Note that we can't write it this way here because of the zero to the right. The zero must be on the left. So what we have to do really is just to swap them and use comma commute. And now we can do this. The way it works is like this. First we pad a zero to the right of our argument, then we drop the first number. Here's a dyadic version where you specify the number of elements to drop to the left. First we determine the number of zeros to pad, then we catenate them to the right argument, then we use the left argument to drop that result. So here we have three shift left of iota 7. Again, it works like this. First we determine the number of zeros to pad to the right, then we pad them, then we drop the number of elements from the left, effectively shifting to the left n elements. Here's a new function, the same thing here. 
And this time we're using the shape instead of padding and dropping. We drop first, we find the number of elements to take, and we take them. Again, just like the previous function, we shift three elements to the left. The first thing we do is we drop, then we determine the number of elements to take, which is basically the shape of the right argument, and we take them. This function here works left or right. You can shift left or you can shift right. You can see the nesting of trains there. The left argument still specifies the number to drop. If negative, we drop from the end. If positive, we drop from the beginning, as before. Then we determine the number to take by first finding the shape of the right argument, and then finding the sign, 1 or minus 1, to multiply it by. So minus 3 means shift to the right. This sign calculation is itself a train, an ATOP, where we add 1 if it's 0, just to make it 1 in case it is 0. As before, the right time is we drop from the end, in this case because it's negative, and then we calculate the number to take either minus 7 or 7, depending on the sign of the left argument. In this case, it's minus 7. The way we find out is by taking the shape of the right argument and multiplying it by minus 1. This one needs a little bit of explanation. We cannot do this exactly, which would give us minus 1 OK, but if it was 0, then we would end up multiplying by 0. So in this case, what we do, we check if the number is 0 itself. In this case, it isn't. But if it were, we would have a 1. If the left argument was a 0, we would be multiplying 0 by the number of elements, which was 7, and we would end up with the number 0. And we would be effectively taking nothing. So we have to have a 1 or a minus 1. And by adding a 1, if it's 0, then we achieve that result. In this case, we add nothing. We still get a minus 3. And by taking the sign, we get a minus 1. And by multiplying by the shape, we get a minus 7, which we can use to get the right answer. This is the final example. This is a solution that also deals with arrays. So far, we've been dealing only with vectors, but this one deals with arrays of any rank. Here we have a matrix of 4 by 3 numbers, and we shift it up 2, and to the right, 1. Here we do the same drop as before. The right time is the drop, so we do the drop, and we end up with a smaller matrix. Now what we have to do is do an overtake of 4 and minus 3, and the numbers to take it by are given by this expression. So we do a drop, and then we do a take. Now, the way we come up with these numbers is by multiplying the shape of the right argument, which is 4 and 3, by these numbers, 1 and minus 1. And the way we come up with these numbers is like this. This is an ATOP. The right function, a fork, ensures that we have the right number of numbers to the left by padding zeros. This allows us to shift only on the leading axis. Like this, we don't have to specify the, the columns we want to shift by. We can only say shift up or shift down. And, and this will pad with zeros if we're short. Then we just assign, as in S4, for each number. Note the use of left tack instead of right tack. Here it doesn't matter since there is only one argument. I am simply reusing the code of S4. So we get the 1 and the minus 1. Finally, we get the numbers to use, and we get the final result. And this also works for higher rank arrays. So in this case here, we're short, we're saying shift up the first plane, shift down two rows, and don't worry about the columns. That's it for this video. I hope you found it useful. Please leave a comment if you can, and see you next time.